Hello, welcome back to our series on vocal anatomy for singers. My name is Jeff Ward. I'm the director of the Kansas State University School of Music, Theater, and Dance, and also the conductor of the Manhattan Flint Hills Masterworks Chorale. Our topic for today is part three in our series on vocal resonance. And to begin this discussion, we're going to begin with a little bit of discussion of acoustics and we'll use some scientific and musical terms and kind of look at how what we a scientific term how that equates to in uh, musical terms um, so to begin this discussion we have to kind of lay the groundwork for a definition of sound so for our purposes for today we're going to use a definition that sound is the perception of the ears when vibrations or sound waves are produced in the air so to unpack that um, definition just a, a little bit um, the sound is is rooted in the perception of the ears so it answers the age-old question if a tree falls in the forest and no one is there does it um, fall well I, it, I think it does fall but it doesn't produce sound unless there's someone there to perceive the sound waves that result from that vibration or displacement of of the air that occurs because the important thing about sound is that it's produced in the air so I'm a big Star Wars fan, and if you watch Star Wars, you hear lots of great special effects as they have battles in space and sounds from lasers. Well, that's obviously not accurate according to this definition because you, there's, there's no air in space. So in the vacuum of space, you can't hear um, sounds produced because there's no sound waves that displace the, that air. But in the human body and the spaces that we sing, and from this picture you can see um, from the larynx up, all of these open spaces are the spaces where air occurs and the vibrations created from the larynx displace that air to create a vocal sound. So um, to begin that, to unpack that concept a little bit, let's lay another definition. That's a vibration. So vibration is defined as the periodic motion of an elastic body. In this case, the periodic motion is the larynx or the vocal folds themselves is creating that, um, that displacement of air. So the sound from an instrument causes vibration of the instrument and the air around it. So that's true of vocal sounds, it's true of, of reed instruments, of string instruments. Um, any kind of vibration of an elastic body displaces that air to create the vibration that we perceive as sound. So to understand that better, let's um, first look at what a sound wave is. A sound wave is just a sine wave, which means that it contains two parts, a compression, a positive, and a rarefaction, a, a negative. So an upper and a lower part of the wave, respectively. So when we talk about um, the term of frequency, we use that a lot in terms of our um, of pitch. So frequency is the number of compression rarefaction cycles that occur within a unit of time. So usually these are measured in cycles per second which we um, a measure at, or label as Hertz, H-E-R-T-Z, and they're are, is um, abbreviated as capital H lowercase z. So when we say A440, the A above middle C, we're saying that that pitch is 440 cycles per second, or 440 um, compressions and rarefactions occurring within a second, so pretty fast. An octave above that is 880 cycles per second, so um, a really very quick frequency to, uh, to create that pitch, but essentially what is happening is, uh, in case of A440, um, 440 hertz or 440 of these compression rarefactions happening per second. Now, a um, thing to think about in terms of a sine wave is amplitude. And you can see from these two drawings, you have two different amplitudes. One is the one on the left is a, um, a deeper amplitude or a greater amplitude, and the one on the right is a lower amplitude. Amplitude is the amount of energy that's affecting the vibrating body, and we measure this in decibels. Um, so in the picture on the left, you have greater amount of energy, so the compression rarefaction um, troughs are, are further away from the medium than in the, the right one. We would say that the, the, the uh, picture on the left has greater amplitude, and the one on the right has less amplitude. 
in terms of what that means musically, we would, like I said, we measure this in decibels, so the, the, the sound on the left is a louder sound, sound on the right is a softer sound. In terms of vocal um, singing, the longer the closure time of the glottis, the greater the amplitude. So we talked about this in our part two of our series when we were talking about phonation, and we talked about glottal closure and glottal opening. So when the vocal folds close together, the greater amount of time they're closed creates the greater amplitude or the louder sound. And we'll, we'll, we'll um, unpack amplitude, how it relates not only to louder or softer sounds, but also to sounds that have um, that may, we may describe as richer in, in tone quality. So the shorter amount of time that the glottis is open, I'm sorry, the glottis is closed, the lesser the amplitude. So softer singing or singing that has less um, amplitude or has less um, uh, uh, harmonics or overtones. Um, this helps us create the uh, the timbre of the sound. So timbre is a musical term. We often re also refer to it perhaps as tone quality, and it's what allows our ear to um, differentiate between sounds of different instruments. Timbre is kind of like the fingerprints of an instrument. What's unique about vocal singing is that when we hear an, a, a trumpet, um, if a trumpet has a similar um, make and manufacturing, that they, we have a unique sound that we hear on a recording, oh, we know that's a trumpet. And the reason why we know it's a trumpet because of its very specific timbre, as opposed to an oboe. So say uh, both of those instruments are playing A440, our ear can differentiate between, even though they're playing the same frequency, same pitch, differentiate between the sound of a trumpet and the sound of an oboe. Well, this relates to um, the voice in a much more complex way because unlike a trumpet, which is uh, many times are, are mass manufactured, um, or at least manufactured with very specific, uh, uh, or with, with very, very precise and similar uh, specifications, the voice is the human body. And so there's a great deal of variance between singer A and singer B, even if they are the same uh, um, voice classification. So the, the unique timbre is really important. To be able to understand how that timbre works, what, what the, what the uh, basis of this unique fingerprint, we have, to look at the, we have to look at the harmonic series. So the harmonic series was developed by the a Greek mathematician Pythagoras, yes, the same Pythagoras of Pythagorean theorem um, fame. Um, the harmonic series is a freq the fre frequencies that occur simultaneously with a fundamental pitch. So in every pitch that um, we play or sing, there are frequencies that um, sound above that um, pitch that we're actually singing or playing. Depending upon the circumstances, such as the type of instrument, the um, the atmosphere where we are um, that we are hearing the sound, um, and in the way in which the sound is produced, all uh, factor into the listener's perception of whether they hear these harmonic series. So um, you probably may have you're, you may have had it in. in um, been an experience where you've been in a very resonant space like a cathedral or maybe even your own bathroom where you sing a pitch or play a pitch and then when it stops sounding you hear notes that are higher than the note that was actually being played or sung. This is all about the harmonic series. So to understand the harmonic series you have to know that it's made up of a, of a number of partials or sometimes referred to as overtones or, harm or harmonics. So the first partial is the note that we are actually singing or playing. So in, as you can see in this um, uh, example, the C2 or the, the C on the below the bass staff is the note that's being played. And each harmonic above that are notes that are heard theoretically be from that note and it always follows the same pattern. So the second partial is an octave above, then a perfect fifth above that, 
the fourth partial is a perfect fourth above that, then a major third, a minor third, another minor third, then major second, major second, major second, major second, minor second, all the way to the twelfth partial. The lower the partial number, the more amplitude or the more energy that it has. So um, how does this affect what what it is the um, what the sound is or what that timbre is. So uh, th some things to think about in terms of timbre factor. The sound spectrum reflects a specific timbre which is determined primarily by these factors. The number of partials. So the more partials in the spectrum, the richer and more brilliant the sound. Well, how can you have more partials? When you looked at that harmonic series, there were 12. Well, that's what's theoretically in in the note. Certain um, In certain circumstances we talked about, we'll have less partials than that. That would be the maximum number of partials if all 12 were present in, in that note. And, things, and there are a number of factors that will diminish or even eliminate some of those possible partials within a tone. The distribution of the partials, and here's where the each human voice ha or instrument has its own particular timbre, like the fingerprints. So when you, when we were talking about that, those 12 notes, those 12 partials that are in every pitch, say for example, instrument A will have the obviously it'll have the first partial because that's the fundamental, and it'll have the second partial, the third partial, not the fourth partial, but it'll have five and six, and not seven and eight. All of each instrument will have a different fingerprint of what partials are present. And not only what partials are present, but also the third um, um, factor, which is the relative intensity or strength of the partials. So if all 12 um, partials are present, some partials are going to have more amplitude or be louder than others. They'll have more energy. So say um, a singer. Um, singer X sings that low C and the second partial is forte and then the third partial is mezzo forte, the fourth partial is piano, but then the fifth partial is mezzo forte. Singer um, Y has a different formula in terms of intensity. First partial, yes, that's the fundamental, then the second partial, maybe that's only a mezzo forte, and then the third partial is a forte. That's going to have a very different timbre um, than, than um, singer X because of not only the distribution and the number of partials but also the relative intensity of those partials. Inharmonic partials um, can also be present. So if partials are present which are not in that harmonic series, they're called inharmonic partials and often tend to have a negative effect on the tone, causing maybe a rough, unpleasant, or a strident tone. Inharmonic partials generally have very high frequency. So we're talking about typically we hear inharmonic partials with um, maybe sopranos, sorry sopranos, um, but may sound like shrill kind of sounds. It's because there are inharmonic partials that are present in that complex um, uh, uh, complex uh, series of notes that our ear is hearing and that it, one of those notes are not in the um, harmonic series, so it's having a negative effect on the tone. The fundamental tone is a, is a huge factor in what the timbre is. So the lower notes tend to sound darker and higher pitches because the higher the freak, fundamental, the higher the partials sound brighter. Um, so we typically, and this is kind of broad strokes, basses tend to have dark tones, sopranos tend to have bright tones. And so when we're dealing with a choral ensemble, mixing those colors are really, really important. We want to brighten the basses and darken the sopranos in some cases so that we have a better, and I, I hesitate to use the term, but the, this is where the term choral blend comes into that. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not a fan of the term choral blend because it denotes, or there's a connotation anyway, that um, that we're asking singers to change a natural or a, a singing style or or do a different use a different technique for um, choral singing when really if they sang freely um, and with musical style um, we can have other ways we can we can make that tone sound like a, a, a wonderful corporate sound but part of that corporate sound is um, taking advantage of of uh, different um, 
vocal techniques to brighten the basses and, and darken the sopranos. And then another um, timbre factor is the total intensity. So the greater the intensity of a tone, the greater the number of partials present. So in our last um, uh, part, when we were talking about phonation, I, I talked a little bit about soft singing versus loud singing. So soft singing, while we certainly want to be musical and follow the um, intentions of the composer, sometimes it can create some problems for singers. Um, in the case of what we were talking about last, um, in our phonation discussion, we talked about hypofunction, that soft singing too softly can cause the muscles not to be engaged enough to be able to uh, create a, a, a beautiful tone. Um, part, uh, another factor of that is if we sing too softly, the, in, it's, the tone isn't in, intense enough, and so there are not enough partials with um, appropriate um, amplitudes to be able to create a sound that has the kind of tone quality that we're going for, whether that's a beautiful sound or a dark sound or, 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 or a bright sound. So intensity is really, really important, and, and loud um, voices, we often say, oh, those are the best voices. Um, Oftentimes we say that not because they're louder, but because they have, um, they're richer, they have a beauty to it because there's, there are more partials in, in that tone quality and they have a greater amount of, of amplitude and energy. So in terms of vocal resonance, basically what we're talking about is the relationship that exists between two vibrating bodies and results in an increase in amplitude and a more efficient use of the sound wave. So in the case of vocal resonance, our primary vibrator is the, the larynx. This imposes its frequency upon the secondary vibrator, which is the vocal tract. And so if these um, two bodies or two vibrators are working appropriately together, the vocal tract actually increases the amplitude and the efficiency of the, of the vibrations that are created from the larynx. So think about this, it's similar to singing in a space that um, where secondary vibrating bodies are sympathetic to the pitch you sing. So vibrating bodies is, in sympathetic vibration is not the same as resonance, but it, it can help illustrate our point. So if you are in, I'll use the shower situation, we have a lot of hard surfaces. If you were to um, sing in a shower, you may notice that certain um, pitches seem resonate louder or vibrate louder in the space than others. And what that is attributed to is that those spaces, perhaps the tiles of your bathroom wall, um, are in tune with that, um, that sound. So we have as a result, bathrooms and or rooms with hard surfaces tend to be um, more live, as opposed to singing in a cloth um, or singing in a room with, with a lot of soft spaces. Um, it deadens the sound because instead of vibrating sympathetically, the um, those surfaces are actually absorbing the sound or dampening that, that sound. Our vocal track works the same way. So, but opposite of the type of, uh, well, well, actually it works exactly the same way. So the soft walls of our vocal tract can respond and be changed to the vibration of the different frequencies and allows us to reproduce a wide spectrum of colors. So when the soft walls of our vocal tract, and we'll unpack that in a moment, become taut, the tone brightens. Just like when you're in a bathroom and it seems like it can be a bright or Ooh, that's really loud and bright and kind of maybe even shrill because you have these hard tiles that the, the sound is vibrating off of. Our vocal tract works in the same way. When the walls of our vocal tract um, relaxes, the sound becomes darker. Since the cavity is less responsive, a, a darker or, or softer space um, or wall is less responsive to partials of higher frequency, just like when you are in a quote unquote dead room. In the case of the dead room, the analogy is is that the sound that we are making with our bodies, our body is the primary vibrator, and the walls of the room is the secondary vibrator. In our own vocal tract, as I mentioned, the larynx is the primary vibrator, and then that space above the larynx in which the air um, and the sound waves travel from your larynx through the um, 
uh, through to your to your mouth and out of your body is that that area is all the secondary vibrator. So a couple of, of terms to be aware, and one is damping. Damping is the time rate at which energy is dis, uh, dissipated in a vibrating body. So it diminishes the amplitude of the sound wave. So in the case of the, um, the, the darker walls, uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, the, the softer walls, the, the, um, where we have this darker sound, the high partials, those higher frequency partials, are damped more than the lower frequency partials because of the nature of the space or, or the material. So this creates a damping effect for higher partials and hence the sound sound um, uh, sounds, sounds darker. Um, within our own singing, inefficient vocal fold action, whether that's hypofunction or hyperfunction, can generate a damping effect as well in the glottis during phonation. So the resulting sound will lack those crucial partials or certain partials in the wave and will not have sufficient ampli amplitude to be adequately reinforced. So we have a less than pleasing sound as a result. Damping also occurs when the vocal tract and the larynx, so again, larynx is the primary vibrator, the vocal tract is the secondary vibrator, when they are out of phase from each other. So this can occur when the cavity size is not appropriate for the specific frequency, the intensity or the amount of energy that's being produced from the primary vibrator, and the vowel. So if the vowel is inappropriate for the frequency. So we're going to unpack that a little bit more as we talk about formants in just, just a moment. Um, critical damping is what we want to try to avoid. It occurs when the larynx and the vocal tract are completely out of phase and so the sound waves actually work in conflict with each other. <coughs> and so in this case, excuse me, so in this case the um, primary vibrator is producing a certain um, sound wave and the way that, that, that it is responding or to the um, to the vocal tract as the secondary vibrator is actually diminishing or damping that sound wave to a point where no, no, um, the amplitude is, is totally dissipated and we don't get a sound at all or we don't get a, a sound that is um, very pleasing at all. So this concept actually we use a lot in um, when we have um, headphones that are noise canceling headphones. So um, if you own a pair of those, you'll maybe hear the difference of when you actually turn it on and when you turn it off. So when you turn it on, it actually is emitting a sound wave that is in that is in, um, complete out of phase with the surrounding sounds, an airplane hum um, or other uh, other ambient sounds. So it sounds like to our ears then that we're not getting any, we can't hear anything. When as a result, what really is happening is it's putting together, you can almost say, an anti-sound wave for those other sound waves it, because it's out of phase. Um, as we mentioned before, and it's important to kind of note as we, before, as we move forward, that the greater the amplitude, the greater the number of partials. We talked about that before with the harmonic series. So the lesser the amplitude, the lesser the number of partials. So that's really important as we um, go to our uh, next step, which is to look a little bit about kind of the scientific uh, grounding in all of this. That we can thank um, uh, German physician or physicist uh, Hermann Hem Hemholtz, who came up with this acoustical law governing resonating bodies. And what he discovered is that um, there are three factors to consider in, in, the, in um, thinking about resonating bodies. One is volume. And what he discovered is that the lower, the, or the larger the cavity, so we're thinking about space, the larger the cavity, the lower the frequency to which it resonates. And the smaller the cavity, the higher the frequency. So when you drop your jaw, you're creating more space in your mouth it darkens the sound because it resonates partials that are of lower frequency. But when you smile, you make, this, make the um, oral cavity smaller and it brightens the sound because it resonates par the partials of the higher frequency. So again, picture that, pic um, put the picture of the harmonic series in, in, in your mind to think about that. That when we have those, um, uh, those, uh, partials 1 through 12, if I smile, I'm emphasizing the upper half of those, maybe maybe partials um, 8 through 12, 
those are being emphasized more so the sound it sounds brighter because the higher frequencies are uh, have greater energy or more amplitude than the lower frequencies the opposite is the case if I make that space in my my mouth larger by dropping my jaw oh I'm creating more space and therefore I'm em um, emphasizing or creating more amplitude and energy for those lower partials so our ears perceive that as a darker sound Another, te uh, another factor is the texture of the walls. We kind of talked about this uh, already, that the softer the walls, the more the lower overtones are emphasized. And the harder uh, the walls, the higher the partials are emphasized. So just again, going back to our analogy of the singing in a bathroom versus singing in a, a movie theater, for example. Um, and then there's the conductivity factor, and this is the most important factor, that there's the coupling between resonators is achieved through the use of articulators. So as we look at the vocal tract, there are many parts of it or many different cavity sizes that are created through what we call articulators. Those can be the tongue, the soft palate, and, or the jaw. And as they change the shape of the space, it affects where the sound wave is going toward and when the sound wave comes back. Um, and so thinking about the, the coupling or acoustical coupling is the relationship between the connected res resonating areas and the mutual interaction of connected resonators as their joint air volumes are set into vibration. That's a, that's a lot. When we look at the vocal track, that'll make more sense. Um, the adjustments of the articulators are used to change the length and the diameter of the orifice or orifices between the cavities. All of that affects the resulting tone quality or, or the number of, uh, of the, the amplitude and intensity of those various partials in the harmonic series. Appropriate coupling creates a wide range of frequency and uh, timbre possibilities in the human voice. All right, so let's unpack that a little bit by looking at vocal, the vocal resonator. When we're talking about vocal resonators, we're talking about the open cavities in which air passes from the larynx out of the body. This is the resonating area, or we also refer to this as the vocal tract. So in this picture, you can see the yellow area as the primary vocal tract. It's made up of the pharynx, or what we colloquially call the throat, the or and the oral cavity. So um, it looks like a strain in this uh, picture of this um, this singer singing in a rather closed E vowel or maybe an U vowel. Um, you have a pretty high tongue, and um, the tongue is an important resin uh, articulator to create that space. The pink area is the nasal cavity, and this is also engaged sometimes in very specific ways. Um, the nasal cavity is engaged when we are singing nasal consonants or vowels. And um, when we're using the nasal cavity, perhaps for a specific technical approach, um, common with a lot of singers. Now, the thing to um, uh, to note is that this is these areas, uh, yellow and pink areas, are the only areas in which sound travels, and hence are our resonating factors. So, when we talk about um, chest voice or head voice. These are not resonators, even if we feel vibration in the skull or vibration in the chest. Those are sympathetic vibrations. The chest is not a part of the resonating system because it's on the wrong side of the larynx. It's below the larynx. So the air is traveling up, not down. Um, and so the chest has nothing to do with the resonance, even though there's that common misconception because we feel some sympathetic vibration in the skull and in the chest that the, the sinal, sinus cavities or the chest cavity is involved in resonance. But as you can see from this picture, that's, that's um, not, not so. So let's, let's um, unpack the pharynx just, just a moment. So this is the most important of the resonators because it is the um, right above the larynx. And so it has the, the greatest uh, uh, impact on, on, the, on the vibration that initially occurs from, from the larynx. So its position and size are determining factors in the sound that comes out. The, um, the most important, um, 
it, because it's the most important resonator, the first six partials are resonated in the pharynx. So if the pharyngeal area, and as you can see from this picture, um, that it's made up of three areas, the laryngopharynx, laryngopharynx, which is the most important, that's where those six partials originate from, the oropharynx, which is that area that um, um, uh, kind of bridges between the, the laryngopharynx and the oral cavity, and then the nasopharynx, which again is only going to be a factor when we're using some kind of nasality, um, whether that's a nasal consonant or nasal vowel, and but it serves as kind of that bridge between the laryngopharynx and um, the nasal cavity. Um, the vertical and horizontal dimensions can be increased or decreased. The tension in the walls of the um, uh, of the uh, pharynx is highly variable, and the size and the orifice leading to the mouth and nose can be varied. So there is a lot of of uh, varying kinds of sounds that can be created simply because of the uh, the shape and size of this area as well as the tautness or softness of the walls that surround it. Another factor that's really important in terms of the pharynx are the muscles that attach to the, the larynx and um, are, are critical to its positioning. So if you would uh, take a finger and find your um, that little notch on your on your neck where where the uh, uh, the th we learned last time is our thyroid or um, our, our yes our thyroid cartilage that shield that protects the larynx and then swallow. When you do that, you probably feel the um, the the larynx go down. That area shifts down. Now yawn. I'm sorry, goes up rather when you swallow. So swallow again, feel it go up. Now yawn and feel how it goes down. So the extrinsic muscles of the larynx that attach to the larynx are, um, are are making that happen, right? So I, the supralaryngeal muscles or those muscles that sit above the larynx, um, they I kind of colloquially call them the, the swallowing muscles. These are the muscles that pull the larynx up, which is a natural motion for the larynx. We tend to speak um, it with a, with a um, pretty high sitting larynx. Our larynx kind of normally sits fairly high in the, um, in the pharyngeal area. But then there are also infralaryngeal muscles or muscles below the larynx that pull down on the larynx and I colloquially kind of call these the yawning muscles. They, they pull the larynx down oh, when you yawn. So these are really critical because the positioning of the larynx will um, affect the size of the laryngopharynx. Because if the larynx is high, hi, how you doing? You kind of have this kind of bright voice. Well, the reason why you have this bright voice is because the larynx rises up and shortens the, the cavity of the laryngopharynx. Remember uh, Hemholtz, his rule that the um, smaller cavities will emphasize higher partials. So hence, it has a brighter sound, whereas bigger cavities will have um, a darker sound because it emphasizes the lower partials. So if I feel like I'm really yawny, I have kind of a darker sound because I'm, excuse me, depressing the larynx or making the larynx descend and that's creating a greater space in the laryngopharynx. Really important in terms of, of creating a, the vocal sound that we're, we're shooting for. The oral cavity is second importance in the um, to the pharynx, um, and its di its um, dimensions are altered greatly by various articulators: the tongue, um, the, uh, the the soft palate, the jaw, the lips, and we'll kind of unpack all of those articulators. Um, but you can see from this from this uh, oh so attractive uh, picture that you have the um, soft palate which is uh, attached to the uvula. So if you look in the mirror, you can see the little dangly thing. That is the piece that's kind of the gateway to, um, to, the, naso or to, to the nasal cavity and the, the nasopharynx. Uh, 
So let's talk about about the tongue first because it is um, really influential in in our vocal sound. The tongue greatly influences the soft palate and the hyoid bone. So remember um, in part two, we talked about the hyoid bone, how it is the only freestanding bone in the human body, meaning it's not connected to another bone. But it, the, but it is connected to the back of the tongue. So how I move my tongue, that back half of the tongue, the root of the tongue, if I depress it, I can push down on the larynx. So when I do that kind of muffly kind of sound, what I actually did to produce that is not use the infralaryngeal, having that sensation of yawning, but I actually use the tongue to push down on um, the hyoid bone and push down on the larynx. So I'm going to sing for you kind of a demonstration. So in this first way, I'm going to sing where I'm using the back of my tongue to bunch up and push down on the larynx um, to create a, a, what's going to sound like a muffly or a dampened sound. Oh. So it sounds like I'm, I don't know, in a hole or something, as opposed to letting the tongue, back of the tongue be more relaxed and using the infralaryngeal um, muscles to pull on, pull on the larynx. Oh. Here's number one with the tongue. Oh. Oh. So you can hear, hopefully, the difference between those two different kinds of sounds. How did I use the um, infralaryngeal? I just kind of had a mental image of singing in a yawny kind of space. I don't have a lot of coordination or or um, or, or um, direct control of oh, like I do with my fingers as I um, for the infralaryngeal muscles. But I can by creating a, an image image in my head of oh, I want to sing through a yawn those muscles engage and then begin to pull down on the larynx in a way that is um, much more uh, uh, much more conducive to a, a beautiful sound. Um, hopefully you thought that was a beautiful sound. We'll, we'll leave that judgment for, for later. Um, so, so that's kind of, and the tongue also of course is um, important for the creation of various vowels and as we as we're going to talk about in just a moment, those vow that vowel formation is really the root of how we create a, a our vocal tract. Um, we already talked a little bit about the soft palate and the velum. So brighter or, or darker resonance timbres are obtained primarily by the relationship between the soft palate and the larynx. So this is an important piece. Um, the larynx and the soft palate are, in a sense, um, it move in opposite directions. So as the larynx rises, the soft palate drops. And as the larynx lowers, the soft palate rises. So as I'm um, singing with a very high larynx, you can probably hear a little bit of nasality in that sound because the larynx is, being, is pushed up and that makes the soft palate go down, which leaves the air, air opening for um, the air to go through my nasal cavity. Okay, as opposed to that oh, yawny space, the larynx drops and the soft palate pulls up and serves as a, a barricade of the air so that none of the air goes into the nasal cavity. It all comes through the oral cavity. Um, and this is why um, when you have you, when you hear French singing, for example, it often sounds brighter brighter than you, perhaps you hear um, uh, leader in German, right? Um, French the French language tends to be a brighter sound because of the nasality of of the of the um, the language. You have nasal vowels, and so in order to make those nasal vowels, the larynx is going to rise and creating a brighter sound, as opposed to other languages like German and English that do not have any um, nasal consonants or vowels, or I'm sorry, nasal vowels, they have nasal consonants, don't have nasal vowels, the, the um, soft palate rises, stops the air from coming, and that will lower the larynx. We talked a little bit about the jaw. The jaw is an important articulator because it can um, uh, 
uh, make the, the oral cavity smaller or bigger, which affects whether the, the sound is brighter or, or darker. The jaw, however, also can restrict or hold back air because if you open your jaw too much, you kind of have, you know, we often tell singers, open your mouth, open your jaw, drop your jaw, and our type A personalities take that to heart and create tension in the neck and, um, and in um, the, the TMJ area, oh, which restricts um, airflow because it restricts the, the larynx. And so um, having kind of a relaxed drop jaw, kind of maybe a, a, a um, think of, Marley in, in A Christmas Carol when he unties the knot and his jaw just drops. That kind of relaxed drop jaw um, is, is what we're going for. Um, another important articulator are the lips. And so I will often um, in, inquire and we talk about um, creating a sound, a, a corporate sound across the choir that um, where, blend, or where darker sounds and, and brighter sounds are not fighting against each other, as I will often kind of use the question of when, when is it okay to smile and when is it okay to pucker. So um, by puckering the lips, what we're actually doing is we're increasing the vocal tract that much more. So if you think about, um, put your hand over your, your lips like you're telling someone to shh, but open your mouth slightly. Okay, when you're not puckered, now, with your finger there, pucker. So look how much your finger moves. So again, just put your finger there, don't pucker, and then pucker. So your, your finger moves that much, and that amount of movement is a significant um, uh, increase to the space that the, the um, sound waves are traveling through. So it creates a darker sound. This is really helpful, especially for, um, well, all singers, but especially for uh, female singers who, when you're trying to darken their tone a little bit, to uh, especially on certain vowels like oo, e, and o. So I'm a real big fan for um, in training uh, female singers on starting with an oo. If singers can sing an oo well, then the other vowels can often be sung in that oo space, so it has the appropriate amount of of color to it for that pucker. Now the problem is if it's done with too much zeal, it could result in dampening of the tone. And we hear that perhaps more with, with uh, male singers than with female singers. So that's when you pucker, but when you smile. So smiling is useful in brightening the tone. I'll often talk to um, singers about brighten the tone with your cheeks or find the the apples of your cheeks. Uh, so smile a little bit and you kind of, you maybe run it into your eyes, you can you can see feel the kind of poofs or the apples of, of your cheeks. Um, a little bit of a smile will help, especially our bass friends, to um, brighten up their ah vowels that are damp. And so when basses tend to, especially use the tongue, to push down on the larynx so that makes it because to them it sounds really good sounds like a big sound on the inside but it's dampened on the outside because the tongue is pushing down on the larynx having them smile a little bit will help brighten it so if i go oh kind of very dark brighten sound but if i brighten ah, all i'm doing really the difference is it's just smiling a little bit, um, raising those apples of my cheeks a bit um, to brighten up the tone. Um, and of course the tongues are, all, the, the, the lips are also um, important in perhaps some uh, articulations of consonants along with the tongue. The nasal cavity, as I mentioned before, is controlled by the soft palate and the velum and um, by allowing air or preventing air from traveling through it. Um, as I also mentioned before, the, um, the, the sinuses or those sinal cav sinus cavities above have no uh, effect on vocal resonance because they are um, not in the pathway that the air is traveling when it leaves the larynx and goes through the, um, uh, the pharynx and the oral cavity or the pharynx and the, the nasal and oral cavities. Um, so that's kind of how the, the physical structure works. So how does the physical structure work in comparison with what we talked about at the beginning um, in terms of acoustics 
and the nature of sound. And this is important to understand a concept called formants. So formants are specific concentrations of energy within the sound wave. Or in other words, they are um, uh, within those um, various harmonic series, they're places within uh, those frequencies that are going to have uh, more energy than others. And these are going to change depending on what vowel we're singing. So all partials that are enhanced are close to the formants. And I'll unpack that a little bit. Um, the, the, the singer's formant, you may have heard that term before, this is the unique ability of a singer to be heard over an orchestra in a huge opera house. Without the concept of formants, without the existence of this phenomena, that could never happen. It's the, the formant concept that allows it to occur. And so it's really important that the singer is thinking about the vowels that they're singing in relation to the pitch and the amplitude. And this goes into what um, we know as the fixed formant law. So the fixed formant law is if a resonating space is shaped in a particular way, it has a given optimum frequency and will augment the partial in the tone which matches its frequency. Or in other words, every vowel has a fixed formant or optimum frequency regardless of the fundamental pitch. So let's unpack that a moment. Oh, I guess before, actually before we move on to the next slide, so I also should say that um, I answer the question, how does the singer make use of the phenomena of formants? So because vocals, uh, vowels shape the vocal tract, formants are fixed for every vowel. So fundamental frequencies above a particular vo vocal fo vowel formant make that vowel impossible to produce without the resonators being out of phase with the larynx. So as you can see from this picture, on the left you see various vowels and then you see spikes in the amplitude. So in the word heed or an E vowel, you see the first spike at a fairly low frequency. That's probably about 200, um, maybe yeah, about two, 200, 200, 250 um, hertz. The second formant or the second kind of spike in energy is um, much further down at about 2200 hertz. And then the third formant is much higher at about 3,600 hertz, as opposed to going to the next um, the next uh, vowel, hid an i vowel. Notice how that first formant is at a higher frequency. And when I keep going down to a head an e vowel, the f fixed formant gets higher. So, regardless of what the fundamental pitch is, that first formant is always going to be the same. And again, by first formant, I mean the first high amplitude spot that where any partial that is in that area is going to get, I guess you like to better say, a, a, a jolt of energy, right? So if I'm singing an E vowel above 250 um, cycles per second, then I miss the opportunity to take advantage of that first formant or that high energy piece. Okay, so let's take a look at this chart. So these are the frequencies of first formants for these various vowels. So an E vowel, that's the I within the in the brackets, that first formant is around F4 or the F above middle C. So if I'm singing an E vowel below that F4, then I can take advantage of that first formant. So say I'm singing F3. So that's the fundamental of the first partial. That means the second partial is going to be F4. It's going to be in that fixed um, uh, formant or high energy. And so it's going to have an increased amplitude and going to be heard above the other um, partials and give me a chance to be able to be heard above the orchestra. Okay. If I were singing lower than that, say I'm singing um, a B flat two, which is the um, the second line of the bass staff. So an, an octave above that. So the second partial would be B flat three, and then 
the second uh, partial would be F4. Again, hitting that first formant, so that's where that second partial then would have that area of high energy and would allow me to um, to increase my uh, the amplitude of my sound, um, and so it would give me a, a, a large, a, a loud sound with a be beautiful, um, uh, beautiful partials because of the richness and the power with uh, within that that sound. As I as I open up that vowel, so I go from e to e to e, so e is the closed vowel like in heed, e. That close e is we don't have a ger uh, an English equivalent of that. That would be like the um, the German word beat e. So that's a close e vowel. Notice how by opening it up just from e to e, I have increased the frequency of that first form at a, a major third. If I go to e as in bed, then all of a sudden the the um, first form is D5. So that's the fourth line of the treble staff. So um, how, what, is this, what does this mean with, um, with vowels? So vowels should be modified to a more open vowel when you get to these points. So you uh, may have been in a choir and the conductor said to sopranos, um, instead of singing the, an E vowel on that high, high note, modify it to an I vowel. Open it up. And the reason why the, the conductor is asking you to do that is because you're singing higher than the first formant. Making, um, making it one, not allowing you to take advantage of that first formant, but also in a lot of cases creating a, a tone quality that's out of phase where the, the, the um, secondary vibrator, the vocal tract, is out of phase with the primary vibrator, the larynx. And so that out of phase um, phenomena causes a sound that's probably unpleasant, whether it's typically shrill or has a strident sound. But by modifying the vowel, by opening up the vowel, you're increasing the first formant, the frequency of the first formant, and it's allowing the secondary vibrator to be more in phase or more in tune with the larynx or the primary vibrator. What are some other things that singers to help um, kind of deal with some issues related to resonance and with the, the law of formants. So um, we often will use, you hear the term covering. Covering is, as we talked about, rounding the lips to provide a larger vocal tract. It, it darkens the sound. Again, very helpful for E vowels or U vowels um, for, um, uh, for, for women in the lower part of their range. And also um, for, for guys, as a tenor, I tend to really like singing E and close E um, when I'm in the upper part of my range than I do open vowels like A ah or, or O. Um, and we already talked about soprano singing issues, the need to modify vowels to open vowels. Um, when we're above the staff, having sopranos just sing A ah vowels the, the, regardless of what the word is, use the other three voice parts to tell the audience what the what the word is. Because if you sing something besides ah, then the, there's great potential for the for the resonator, um, the secondary resonator, to be out of phase with the um, the larynx, and it's going to create an uh, an unattractive sound. And another kind of good rule of thumb is the mirror image of voices. So male and female voices are mirror images of each other. So the male voice. Um, li uh, tends to be more effective and efficient on the bottom when it's using open vowels like ah or e, eh. and as it rises, it's more efficient using closed vowels on the top like e, e, eh, or u. Females are the opposite; they are closed vowels on the on the top. Um, I'm sorry, closed vowels on on, on the bottom, e, e, eh, u when they're the bottom of the range and then opening back up on the top. So you kind of have this mirror image, male and female, um, male high voice, female low voice using um, closed vowels and then on the outer extremes having uh, open vowels on the bottom for men and on the top for women. So um, that's that's the end of our, of our 
um, discussion and session on on resonance. It's a rather complicated um, topic, but it's really important to kind of understand how the physics of sound and the way that we make sound physically is uh, interrelated in how we develop our vocal technique and what we ask our choirs um, to do. So again, just like um, uh, I, I said before, if as you if you watch this and you have some questions, please don't hesitate to send me an email. I can be reached at jeff98 at ksu.edu. Thanks and have a great day.